15 seconds to go. <laughs> Welcome back to the second seminar of this event. And in case you did not participate early this morning, my name is Anna Holmberg. I represent the Swedish Forest Industries, and I have the pleasure of being today's moderator. And I will repeat a little bit of the practicalities and safety instructions from this morning. Uh, all of us here at the Renaissance Hotel need to fully comply with the hotel's COVID-19 measures, including wearing a mask, keeping a distance, and using the hand sanitizer stations. And for those of you watching the broadcasting, once again, we do hope that you are safe wherever you are. We are broadcasting and taking pictures in the room, and if the fire alarm goes off, it is not a drill. Instead, we will evacuate the room through the doors at the back or on either side of the stage up here in the front. And if you are active on Twitter, please use the hashtag green source. We are following what's going on on that Twitter hashtag, and when appropriate, we will pick up uh, comments and perhaps questions. Well, thank you. Um, let's kick uh, things off, and we'll do that with a movie. Welcome back, and without any further ado, I give the word to Mr. Juri Ringman, Director General of CEPI. The floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Welcome to this second half of the event, uh, where CEPI is the co-organizer. We are a proud partner of the European forest-based ecosystem, and industrial ecosystem like no other. We make products for your everyday life, from wooden houses to furniture, from paper and board to green chemicals in uh, food and pharma. We are an amazing industrial power. Did you know that one out of five European manufacturing companies are in this ecosystem? Providing jobs for 3.5 million Europeans. That's not nothing. We increasingly combine digital solutions to our renewable material. We are organized in industrial symbiosis where pie streams and 
residues are used, reused and recycled so that every cubic meter of wood gets used 2.5 times. Most importantly, we all share in this ecosystem three S. Sequestration, storage and substitution. It's an ecosystem that holds the keys to a sustainable European economy, enabled by this resilient industry of the future. As a key player in the forest-based ecosystem, pulp and paper industry has since long already diversified from the traditional products. We are leaders in circular economy, in renewable energy, in climate change mitigation. Exciting innovations are announced daily, literally daily basis. And we invest more than 5 billion euros every year in Europe, more than twice the average of manufacturing sectors in Europe. We source from Europe, we manufacture, we recycle in Europe with European technology. What can be more resilient than that? With 20% of our production exported, we actually generate vital income to the European society. But we are not thinking that this is all good and enough. What if consumers were empowered to do better? I claim that this substitution effect, keeping fossil emissions in the ground by opting for a low carbon product instead, will have a significant and immediate climate mitigation impact. Let's take an example. This chart compares plastic to paper and port packaging. Today, plastic packaging has three times larger CO2 footprint. And in 30 years time, plastic packaging, so three decades from now, they still will be higher than paper and port is today. And by then they will be seven times worse than paper and port. One quarter of all plastics can be immediately replaced by paper and board. This is a huge untapped potential for substitution, and it's not the only one. There are lots of elements for substitution. So why are we continuing to pump fossil from the ground? Why are consumers not empowered to choose better when better solutions are available on the market? Because they could keep the fossil in the ground instead. Some think that they have a clever answer. They say that forest sink will then be the compensation for all, all of that. Well, is that really a sustainable solution? The EU will be the first carbon neutral continent by 2050, and our industry has a strategic role to play in that development. Respecting the owners of the European forest, we are not claiming the forest sink for ourselves. We are planning to, to become truly fossil free. But if the EU policy, on the other hand, is relying on the forest sink owned by someone somewhere to help those sectors that are considered to be difficult to decarbonize, it will be counterproductive, it will be inefficient, and it will be far from fair. Why counterproductive? Forests are not threatened by sustainable forest-based bioeconomy, but by the other sectors. Not the man in the forest, but the other people. And most of all, all it's threatened by the climate change. The more fossil we pump up from the ground, the harder it gets for the forest to adapt, shaking actually the foundations of this policy. Why inefficient? Most fossil intensive value chains are global, so much beyond the scope of EU policies. Allowing to continue fossil production forces our society to rely on slow, less optimal and far more expensive mitigation tools. While on the other hand, avoiding those emissions in the first place with low carbon alternatives would immediately tackle the root cause, much cheaper, much faster. Why not fair? 
the policy choice is likely to result in calls for increased protection of forest as a sink. This would risk availability of sustainable wood for the forest-based ecosystem and in the worst case, even <laughs> reversing the substitution towards more fossil intensive production. I think it's something we should really consider very seriously. Is it fair to announce today that still in 30 years time, some are not expected to, to decarbonize? Is it fair to create incentives in the policy that are exporting pollution and importing loss of resilience of the EU economy? I trust that uh, after today's discussions, you will make up your own mind. And perhaps you will join SEPI and the other forest-based sectors in calling for a efficient, fair and resilient climate policy for Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. And yes, a round of applause is, is appropriate at this time. Yes, thank you. And Yuri is back on stage at the end of the seminar to share his main takeaways. So we are today going to discuss two very relevant political topics here in Brussels, namely climate change mitigation and later sustainable products. But we'll start with climate. And if we want to simplify things, we can say that the climate policy debate is very much around two years, 2030 and 2050, and how much emissions are to be cut by each one of those years. In March of this year, the Commission put forward a proposal for a climate law, which defines a 2050 climate neutrality objective. Then only a few weeks ago, the Commission proposed a change to this proposal, also including a 2030 target and uh, setting that target at minus 55%. And since the March proposal, the co-legislative process has been going on here in Brussels, and you see here on the upper line of this slide that in the Parliament it is the Environment Committee who has been in, in charge and the rapporteur has been Jutte Guteland of Sweden. And then on the lower line you see that there are discussions ongoing between member states in council. They started already in June under the Croatian presidency. They are ongoing as we speak under the German presidency and it could very well be that they would continue also in the beginning of next year, then under the Portuguese leadership. But once the Parliament and the Council has reached their position, it will be final negotiations, so-called trialogue. And then the European Union will, for the first time, have a, um, a climate law, a specific so-called climate law. And we will soon debate this with representatives of Parliament, Commission, Member States and the forest-based sector. But first, we're going to listen to a highly relevant scientific intervention. So at this point, I welcome Dr. Peter Holmgren to the stage. And I'll read your credentials while you're making yourself seated. So you're a forestry specialist, and you've earlier been the Director General of the Center of International Forestry Research. I hope I got that right. Did I? I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yes, good. Continue, continue. <laughs> Keep on talking. Yeah, yeah. So you're going to present a report commissioned by CEPI on behalf of the forest-based value chain, focusing on the climate effects of the forest-based sector in the European Union. Mm. The stage is yours, Peter. Uh, many thanks, Anna. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, this report was commissioned by CEPI together with a range of other European-based uh, forest organizations. Now, normally I would... Um, speak about forests and forestry from a multifunctional perspective, all the benefits we can get from the forest to our society for sustainable development. Today, it will only be about the climate benefit. And it will be about how do we actually tell that story that we've heard already several times this morning so that it can be shared and, and appreciated in a much wider circle than the forest specialists and, and, and the policy makers. So to start that story, I will first have a, a section in my presentation about what about the forest-based sector and the climate. And remember, we're only talking about the climate, so I will narrow down the scope of the forest to generating a wood supply to forest products and that 
the market is, is also generating a demand for, for that wood, so that we have, a, we have a functioning market here, if you like. But it's about the climate, so we have to transform this picture into, into the basic biophysics of the forest-based sector. And in that sense, the forest is a carbon storage. It supplies the biomass to forest products. Th those forest products are used, they are reused, and eventually they are being combusted. And, and in most cases, we're actually making good use of the energy that is contained in, in these products. It then goes back into the atmosphere, the carbon that is, um, and actually back into the forest through the photosynthesis. Sometimes we hear that, that there's a time lag here, but let's not focus on the time lag or that discussion at the moment. Let's just focus on this is a balanced circle. As long as the carbon storage in the forest is not reduced, we have a circular functioning market. And in fact, it's very small text, um, so you can't read it, but we harvest about two-thirds of the stem wood that grows in Europe every year. And that actually corresponds only to five or six percent of the total biological production in the forest. So we are on the safe side, if you like. But we have to take this story a little bit further. Um, and now I'm adding to the figure, I'm adding a few things. I'm adding the forest industry, which is of course where that wood is being transformed into the products. I'm adding, importantly, the recycling of products, which is key for, for our um, performance in the circular economy. And I'm also adding some, some other uh, snippets here. Um, as you can see, I'm, I'm adding the concept of recycling of carbon. I've been thinking about how do you explain the circularity here? Um, and actually, what we're talking about is recycling of carbon. The carbon we've been using for a while in forest products sooner or later makes its way back to the atmosphere, and then we recycle it in the forest. And not only that, we're actually building up that storage. We have a net sink in the forest. Finally, there is a small uh, piece um, that comes from the forest and in a shorter circle goes back to the forest. That is the traditional energy use that we actually have quite a lot of in Europe uh, to this day. So all of this happens in the atmosphere and the biosphere, but what we're interesting, interested in here is how does this affect the global climate? Then we have to add the fossils. Um, and we have to add that we are taking those fossils into the atmosphere. And then we have to think about where are the interactions between the forest-based sector and the climate in this picture. First of all, we have that net sink. We know all about that. Whereas the forests in Europe are growing, uh, the storage is, is growing, and, and that's a good thing. And actually, we report this to the Climate Change Convention every year. We also report um, the storage in the harvested wood products. This is actually not in itself an interaction with the global climate, but it, taken together, these two points are the added storage of carbon in the sector. And it's being reported every year to the convention. Every country in the union reports this. So there are good numbers. We understand this. But if you want to look at the totality of the sector, we have to add a few things. First, we have to, to, to say that there are fossil emissions in the sector. Um, the industry itself has, by and large, re reduced that to zero in, in many places. But there are still other pieces. Transportation is a big emission factor, for example. So that's one factor. The next factor, and here comes the, 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 the substitution effect. The substitution effect works so that some of those fossil emissions are not made. Some of that oil or coal stays in the ground. So this is an immediate effect that we need to take into account. Um, two points to make here. One is it's not the same as storage. The storage in the harvested wood products is one thing, the substitution effect is another thing. And secondly, this is by and large invisible in current climate reporting, so we don't really have a good picture of, of what it is, and that's why this report was, was commissioned in the first place. Then finally, we have an effect of, of that traditional energy use. It's a smaller factor, so I will not spend a lot of time on that. 
So these are the five points we, we identify as how the forest-based sector interact with the global climate. But there are some points that need attention in this. First of all, the net sink, we do report that, as I said. It's part of the LULUCF reporting. However, when IPCC produces their global reports, they do not include that net sink. In the land report, for example, um, you can read that it, it's, it's explicitly excluded, which makes that, means that there is a dissonance between those reportings, which they also make clear. Secondly, some still argue that the biogenic emissions should be counted as fossil ones. This is perhaps a very contentious part of the debate at the moment. Um, the picture we are, preparing, we are presenting here is that this is indeed carbon recycling. It doesn't add to the climate change, and this is also how it has been agreed in, in the climate change conventions. Still, there is a debate. Thirdly, as I mentioned, substitution is hidden from view in official climate reporting. It's not absent, because when, um, let's say, concrete is replaced by wooden construction, the concrete sector will have reduced emissions, but that doesn't become visible for the forest-based sector. So it's there, but it's invisible. And then finally, because of the sector structure in the climate uh, process, the forest is typically separated from the value chain and, and the circularity that we are telling the story about in, in, in this report. And the obvious example of this is that we have a separate LULUCF regulation, which is, is only looking at what's happening in the forest. Okay, so the next part of this presentation is to give you a snapshot of the European forest-based sector so that we know what we're talking about. This is a map that shows the forest, and it also shows in blue circles the size of the forest industry in the different uh, European Union countries, plus a few others that are not members anymore. Um, and as you can see, the forests are spread out all across Europe, and so is the industry. The main point of this, to show this picture is to say that the forest-based sector is not only a Sweden and Finland affair. It is something that is large and, and very much contributing to the climate solutions in all countries in the Union. In fact, you can see at the bottom here that, that uh, Sweden and Finland, yes, we have indeed 29% of the forest area. That's a lot. Um, we only have 22% of the growth, though, because it's much colder up where we are. And we actually have 20% of the output because we have less recycled input in, in our end of the, of the sector. So the picture is that it, this is a European-wide sector that is important in all places. This picture is a dynamic um, description of what's going on. There's been some debate over the summer about harvesting levels in, in Europe, and I thought I should use this picture to, to provide um, a perspective based on official statistics that all countries provide and that are of very high quality in, in, from European countries. From that, we can, we can see that the growing stock in European forests have increased by 40% between 1990 and 2015. This is a huge increase. It's partly because the area has grown. The area has actually grown by double the, si double the combined size of Belgium and Netherlands in this period. And it's partly because the volume per hectare is going up quite rapidly in most places. If you look at the harvests, there are good statistics on that as well, you can see the, to the blue line is the total harvest in Europe since 1963. It's going slowly up. It's currently at, at about 500 million cubic meters per year. By comparison, the orange line is Sweden and Finland. It's also going up, but not as fast as for the rest of, of, of the continent, which is interesting. Then you see a little green dash at the top. That's how much it grows. So we are not harvesting the growth, far from it. So a question to take from this picture is, what are we going to do with all that wood?
wrong button. Okay, now the substitution effect. Um, this is a complex thing and, and we need to understand it well. Um, actually, calling it the substitution effect in a way makes it an alternative. I don't really like being the alternative, so I, I think we should start talking about elimination of demand of fossil fuels because that's what it is about. There are some, some issues around this. First of all, what is the question? Well, since there has not been any firm standards developed, this varies a little bit between different studies. But most common, common is to express this as how much fossil carbon remain underground for each ton of carbon in the forest-based products. And we can measure that in tons of carbon by tons of carbon. Um, this works for the normal forest products, but it may not work for other uh, forest um, benefits. For example, um, wild meat is difficult to, to use this measure for, but that's actually another substitution effect that we can bring up in another study. Some issues here. Um, if we focus too much on the products as such, we're missing the, we, there is a risk that we miss the big picture. I mentioned the methodology standards, they have not evolved yet because there is no formal reporting of substitution effects. Research results are therefore a bit limited and can be difficult to compare. And if we use averages for broad product categories, this will conceal products with very high effects and those with little effects. And of course, we would like to gear towards those that have a high effect, seeing it from a climate perspective. So that, that's another issue in this. Taking all that together and basing it on, on past studies, um, it is possible to derive some conservative substitution factors, which we've done in this study. For solid wood products, we know that building with wood is better than building with fossil-based materials. We estimate that 1.5 tons of fossil carbon remain in the ground for every ton of carbon in, those, in, 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 in the wood-based products. For fiber products, it's a bit lower. Um, but still, packaging and combining that with the energy use at the end generates a substitution effect of about one ton per ton. Per ton. Bioenergy also generates substitution effects. We put this conservatively because not all bioenergy systems are efficient. But still, there is a substantial effect also of that. And then for traditional bioenergy, it is much less. So the point here is that all the different product categories contribute to the substitution effect. So the, what are the results? And what is my timing? Two, three minutes. That's okay. So back to this figure. We had five points of interaction, right? So let's take the first two, the net forest sink and the har har harvested wood products. These are known figures. They are in the official statistics. We can just read it from there. 400 tons of net sink, that's about 10% of the EU emissions, and about 41 in increased storage and harvested wood products. That's good. We have some emissions, there are about 51 million tons, a lot of that in transportation, as I mentioned. Uh, the industry as such is all, almost fossil free in many places. We have the substitution effect. It is as big as the net sink, 400 million tons per year. And then we have a small effect of the traditional energy use, but that's kind of negligible in this context. So if we add those together in a table form, we get a sum of 800 million tons of carbon dioxide per year as a climate effect of the forest-based sector. That's 20% of EU emissions. Calculating conservatively and not taking into account the, the efficiency gains that uh, I think Yori mentioned in his previous uh, uh, intervention. 20% of EU emissions today. Um, oops, that's not my picture. Not yours. Can I go so back? So just stay there, Peter. Uh, first of all, a round of applause for Peter for his presentation. Can we get a bit of noise in the room? Yeah. Thank you. And since I'm the moderator, I get the, the, you know, the privilege of asking you a few questions straight away. So... Correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the, the new big thing with this study is putting a number on the climate effect from material substitution. Yes, the material substitution and the energy substitution. Both are important, but of course the material substitution is what we never hear about, as you mentioned before. Mm. Um, 
Is there any risk that you've double counted these numbers? No. Um, I think nope. this, this, is, uh, this is a discussion that originated from, from not really separating uh, the storage in harvested wood products from the substitution effect. And it's really important to keep them apart. There is no, no double counting in, in that sense. Is the study peer reviewed? Um, we've done this study, we've used this model in a number of, of uh, situations um, at, for, at corporate levels and at the Swedish level. And the method as such is peer reviewed and we have had scientific uh, uh, roundtables around it. Still, there is a need to do more science here and this is a call for, for those that, that work on uh, forest and climate issues. But you're saying the calculation methodology has been peer reviewed yes. earlier. Yes. And here you've applied the same methodology. That's okay. right. And I know from the study that you have um, gathered data for 27 member states and three more countries. Mm. Norway, Switzerland, UK. Oh, UK. I, I keep thinking about them as part of the union. I'm sorry. That was for you, Clive. Uh, mm. So, um, if we turn this into the Eurovision Song Contest, mm -hmm. just imagine. I know you're a scientist, but go with me on this. So, this is the Eurovision Song Contest. So, which country or member state is going to get the 12 points in these calculations? 12 points to Germany. Germany. So it's like the World Cup in football then. We play for 90 minutes and then Germany wins. It's something like that. But uh, in fact, uh, it, it, is, it proves my point earlier that, that this is not a Swedish and Finnish issue. It, it is really a European-wide uh, forest-based sector that contributes. And, and uh, Germany happens to have a very large forest industry uh, and very uh, high rate of growth in their forests. Okay. Good. Well, thank you, Peter. Hmm. You are released from your island. You can make your thank way you. down to the, to the seat. Uh, and now we'd like to hear a bit from you as participants and those of you are on the live broadcasting. So get your device out again. And you've been active here already. So this time we're asking you, which key finding from this study do you think can reinforce or have the biggest influence on EU climate policy going forward? And we're asking you, could it be the fact that the forest-based sector removes 20% of EU fossil emissions? That is the brown, the blue part. Or the yellow, is it because promoting forest-based products, then we can keep even more fossils in the ground? Or is it the third alternative that the forest-based sector's impact can grow even more with the right policy tools? Things are moving, it means that people are answering. It's interesting how it's shifting. It's getting almost like a dead, dead race here. Well, look at that. I think we'll sort of give a call here that there seems to be a majority saying that the main takeaway that will influence policy going forward is the fact that this is a big impact, but it can grow and be even bigger with the right policy tools. Yes. I am now happy to present a new panel for you, and this time we're going to discuss the role of forests and forest products in for carbon neutrality, and is EU climate policy going in the right direction or not? And with my help to do that, I will on this island over here have a very knowledgeable person by the name of Artur Runge Metzger. So please make your way up to your island. You have some sanitizing equipment there in case you feel like you want to do a swipe. So Artur is director at the Directorate General for Climate Action at the European Commission. Welcome. And on this side, I'm welcoming Piotr Borkowski. Piotr is executive director at Eustafor, the European State Forest Association. Welcome to you as well. Thank you. And then with us via link, we are going to have, and now <clears throat> here's the challenge for me to pronounce correctly, Joao Moreza Sarmento. Is Joao with us? Yes. I am. Welcome. You are the Councillor for Environment at the Portuguese Permanent Representation to the European Union. You're very welcome. Thank you. And within very shortly, we will have a blonde lady arriving. You will see her walk her way through here and be on that side. It is Jutte Guteland, a member of European Parliament, Parliament and Rapporteur on the Climate Law. She has been somewhat upheld. Um, 
in uh, a discussion in the parliament, but she is on her way, so just bear with us. But we will kick off this discussion with the three gentlemen. So, uh, my first question is going to be similar to the one that we asked to the audience. So, in other ways, having listened to the results of this study, what do you think will be the main impact on EU climate policy going forward? And I think, since the lady is not here, we'll start with you, Piotr, on this side. What do you think will be the impact? Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I should say thank you to the presenter, to the expert, because it's indeed very good presentation, actually drawing uh, everybody's attention to the aspects which have not been until now very explicitly explained in the policy making process. So uh, I also would like to thank uh, SEPI for inviting you, for among other actors in the forest based uh, value chain, uh, to. to and we, we gladly supported this study because we believe it should be how forest, widely defined forest value chain should be reflected in the future EU climate policy. So, of course, we hope that as much as possible will be picked by the European policymakers. We have one uh, of those from the Commission, Mr. Runge Metzger, among us. We have also uh, members of European parliaments, but we have also governments hopefully following this event. And the message is clear. If we include the value which can be provided by the entire sector with these three S as we are supporting as the European State Forest Association as well, so sequestration, storage, but substitution, then the overall positive effect and contribution to meeting the 2050 targets which be more significant than compared to when we, for example, consider forests as assets which should serve mainly as the sink, mm -hmm. carbon, carbon sink. So for me, it's, uh, I cannot tell you whether it will be taken for sure and to what extent, but I can only share with you my hope that it will be as much taken as possible. And over to you, Zhao. Uh, do you think there will be uh, an impact on climate policy going forward uh, based on this report, and in that case, what? Hello, good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for uh, the invitation on behalf of the Portuguese permanent representation. Um, listening to, to, the, to the study, uh, I think there, there, are quite, there are several elements in this study that uh, are important. We, have, uh, we are in a defining moment, uh, or a redefining moment for climate policy in the EU. So, um, I think elements like this and studies like this will certainly help us uh, make way in our, in our progress on the several uh, climate files and overall the, the LULU-CF file that we know that uh, we will have to look into carefully in, in, during next year. Um, and so this is what I would like to point out at this point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And then over to the policymaker, Arthur. Um, does a report like this, does it make any difference in the policy discussion? Um, maybe first to say I'm not the policymaker. The policymaker will come through that door very soon. <laughs> You're a policy um, proposal. <laughs> we're making policy proposals. No, if I look at the study, um, I think um, from what I've seen in the presentation, um, it 100% supports what the Commission has been proposing in terms of its long-term strategy, and also, um, when you look at the 2030 framework, um, where we have set a target, minus 55%, but we have at the same time said it will require some modifications, changes in the legislative framework. And there's some indication in the communication on what needs to be done. And I think one of the aims is to better reflect what is the contribution of um, the land use, land use change and forestry sector. I think that's a clear intention uh, that is mentioned in the communication. So I would think that uh, we are 100% in line uh, with the main findings. Uh, we can kind of fight about a number here and a number there and maybe did you account it in this way or the other way, but uh, it's very clear already today in our inventories we have this, what uh, is called the invisible effect, is fully captured. Um, we recognize the value uh, forests and um, agriculture products give when it comes to the energy sector. Uh, but we also, I think, take into account the sink 
um, of uh, the agriculture and the forestry sector. So on all these different elements, I think they are very clearly uh, enshrined in the policy going forward. What you will also see in uh, other policies that are facilitating, like the research policy, um, that we support the, what is called the bioeconomy. Mm. Um, and that means that we should make um, much more use of um, natural products, natural feedstocks uh, in our industries and uh, in the different parts. And we see there is a lot of innovation happening. Um, and I think um, there is a possibility to accelerate. Otherwise, we wouldn't have put forward the 55% target, mm -hmm. which means a doubling of the effort that is required in the next 10 years compared to what we had just decided uh, two years ago. And you used the expression, there is this invisible effect. Yeah. I believe Peter said the effect is embedded. Uh, and I know you and I have discussed this before, that the effect is out there. It's just not visible today in policy in that way that Peter has. But is that something we could expect? Could we expect, could we expect policy going forward that actually shows, sort of attributes the fossil emissions kept in ground due to use of forest-based products, that that would be sort of... I think you see it in, when you look at the graphs um, going forward in terms of climate neutrality, uh, and also if you look at the impact assessment now for the 2030 communication, we clearly say that um, the consumption of coal, for instance, in the next 10 years is going to be cut by around 70% compared to 2015. And part of that is subject to um, more use of biomass in the energy sector. Uh, but of course, there's also more use of solar panels and of uh, wind energy in order to generate the energy we, uh, we need uh, to substitute the coal, if you want. So the substitution effects are there. We have not assigned them to each individual industry because we have the same discussion with, um, let's take the steel industry, the steel industry saying, uh, but look, all these windmills are built with steel. Um, so we are substituting through steel production um, coal. Um, and you can do that across the entire society. Um, and, and of course, you will always come crossways. Mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. uh, but these exercises are being done at the present point in time because I think all industry is looking at the entire supply and value chain. And I think that is good. That is the way we should be thinking in terms of the entire integration of that. Yeah, uh, you know, that's the normal way of thinking when you run a business. You have to think the value chain. <laughs> yeah, but kind of, uh, let's be honest, uh, for 200 years, um, many people were not looking at the full no. value chain. They were looking at, okay, where can I get this input and where can I get that input, how yes. that input is being produced. And I think even if you look at the world, let's be honest with each other, uh, that is not happening everywhere in the world. It's a trend and we want to push that forward. Uh, you have seen our circular economy action plan, um, which also has some elements uh, that relate to forests. Um, so that is the way we want to definitely take it forward. Thank you. Back to you, Zhao. Um, are you, when you are negotiating this, you know, the climate law and the 2030 target in the council, is the topic of uh, avoiding fossil emissions through material substitution, is that even on the table in your negotiations? Or is it perhaps something even that Portugal is promoting? Well, um, the challenge for 2030 and 2050 is very big. And, um, and the council, we are, we are at this point addressing all the elements that the commission has set out into uh, the, the proposals. and. Uh, our German colleagues are doing uh, very uh, extensive work and, uh, and they're committed, very committed to, to look into the climate assist plan that we have been presented. We are still in very initial stages of the debate of the presentation of the plan. And uh, yes, uh, the sinks and all the, the, the context uh, surrounding forest is one of the important elements we have, uh, the commission has uh, been very clear that uh, we have to act in the way that uh, we can increase or revert uh, what has been identified as uh, the decrease in, uh, in uh, our ability to uh, capture uh, carbon naturally. So 
This is one of the elements that's been uh, highlighted. Uh, and we will address that, of course, in council and the, the debates that we will have on the climate assist plan and on the proposals that will appear in June next year by the end of our presidency. Okay, thank you. Piotr, in, the, in her State of the Union address on the 16th of September, Ursula von der Leyen highlighted the climate benefit in William Wood. And I think you probably noticed this, so did many other of us in the forest-based sector, as a very positive statement. Do you think this is the icebreaker that will now sort of uh, uh, bring climate policy forward, talking about the benefits of, of material substitution? Yes, indeed. Uh, we noticed this, of course. We even published last Friday uh, a respective statement as a reaction from state forestry organizations. We, we welcome this statement very much because actually it draws very much the public attention to important sector which can be even uh, strengthened in terms of its um, climate uh, neutrality delivery in the future. But what is important there is that this sector is being, uh, has been used until now and then it can even use more renewable sustainably produce raw material. Mm. So, of course, it's only like one of the outputs of forestry, one of the end uses. When talking about general multifunctionality of forest management, but even if we narrow this down to, to this economic function and wood as a main output, we have also some other assortments for other industries. So that's why we, we are gladly uh, talking about these forest-based industries ecosystems, which embraces a number of industries which are making living actually on the primary product which is delivered from sustainable forest management. And in the statement of Mrs. van der Leyen, it was very good that she drew the attention to this particular sector, but in somehow interpreting the message, we should keep in mind that this sector is much broader. Mm. And uh, I believe that also the study presented just a while ago also shows us that the the potential which can be, the, the, the possible gain is much broader than what even was taken into account uh, to, to date pol policy analysis. And then I'm also happy to hear from uh, Arthur that uh, commission is very sensitive on this and is trying to embrace uh, all these elements and then also supported by the solid data from international reporting into its policy analysis in future policy planning. But at the same time, uh, still I have the impression that uh, in, in the recently published this 2030 uh, climate target plan, we still see forests as, as a sector. Uh, Forest-based industry is maybe not uh, very explicit there, but still forests are mentioned like, and the role is, uh, forests are, have assigned this role of, of carbon sinks, which automatically draws the attention somewhere else. So then if we can have in the future policy uh, making a bit of more balance and explaining actually that there are also other contributions f which can be uh, achieved from forests, which is a very genuine European asset managed over decades in a way which, sh which shows also in solid numbers that the resource develops. The resource may be setting aside the current situation with, with, with uh, for example, bark beetle inf infestation or this climate-induced uh, negative events uh, over the last uh, two, uh, three, four years. But in general, we can see also positive tendencies when it comes to forest health, vitality, we still have a lot to, to invest, uh, mm. which I believe also strong political support should come uh, uh, from uh, EU climate policy because then maybe I will have a chance to, to refer to this later on, but then... Yeah, I think the, the we'll actually move on now and, and go to another topic. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would like to discuss a bit about, you know, how do we divide the fairness and the solidarity concerning these climate objectives? and. I would like to start by claiming on behalf of the forest-based uh, value chains that we, you know, all sectors of society and member states need to pitch in 
to reach these climate objectives. And as we heard Yuri Ringman say before, any other setup would be counterproductive, inefficient, and not fair, or far from fair, I think, were the use you used. So to be more explicit, we are afraid that we would be the forest sinks that need to absorb emissions while other sectors or, or other actors would continue with their fossil emissions. So I'll go back to you now, Arthur, because in the climate law proposal in March, you suggested that it was the union as a whole that should reach climate neutrality for 2050. And now, two weeks ago, you also proposed that it's the EU as a whole to reach a 2030 target of minus 55. Why did you propose it this way? Would it have been too hot a political potato to say that every member state or every sector should reach it? I think that goes straight to the heart of fairness, um, what you're saying, because if you look around in the member states, it's true, you will find trees everywhere. But I think as Peter was outlining, it's very different from one member state to the other. So in terms of the um, kind of what is God given, or if you want to say it, put it like that, in terms of your natural resource base is very different in Europe. And I think we are convinced in Europe that um, if we stick together, we will solve the problem in the most efficient way. But that also means that everybody will have to bring to the table where he is good at. Um, because I could also put the question and say, okay, in terms of orange production, let's make sure everybody produces the orange uh, he wants to eat, whether he lives in Sweden and Finland or whether he lives in the Mediterranean. And I think from that example you will see it's good that we have trade in Europe because everybody can put into the system uh, what he's good at and where he has a comparative advantage. And definitely, uh, if you look at Sweden and Finland, there is a comparative advantage looking at these different uh, functions uh, that forests can fulfill. Um, and I think uh, that was, um, I think, uh, is a good point maybe to explain why is there so much emphasis in the communication that just came out on the sinks side. Yes. The, the issue is, I think, it goes back to the IPCC report on 1.5 degrees Celsius. Because if you look there at what needs to happen globally until the year 2100, is that we not only need to bring fossil emissions down to zero, we also need to make sure that we capture CO2 from the atmosphere. And depending on how much fossil fuel goes out, the more we will have to capture. And that capturing function is not infinite, it's finite. Um, kind of, we have not only so much land in Europe where forests can grow. So that also means there is a limit to it. And we need to manage that very well. And we also need to make sure, of course, that in terms of the balance, in terms of the contribution of forest, it's going to be optimized. So the different streams you have been presenting, there is somewhere an, an optimum uh, which we should achieve in order to make it cost efficient. Um, when we look at what is happening in Europe in terms of the things, um, and you can look at the progress reports of the Commission, since 2013, the sink function is declining. Uh, it is true that the net sink is there still in Europe, but it's going down. Uh, and we see in nature what is happening. Uh, there is a lot of pressure because of climate change. If that continues and if that is unchecked, then we might lose the sink, which would mean if you really want then to capture CO2 from the atmosphere, you are left with carbon capture and storage. And we know this debate in Europe in terms of how many friends you have. It's also a difficult discussion. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I think we were ringing the alarm bells a little bit and saying we need to do more in terms of thinking about our forests uh, and what needs to be done. And that's not only the forests, it's also the sink that we have in the agricultural soils. Um, and I think we will come out with a forestry strategy in a few months' time, uh, where hopefully we can start addressing some of these issues. Because what is clear is that there is definitely more political acceptance to use forest as things in Europe. 
So we should see, is there possibilities to expand the thing? Uh, and it is in the soil, and it's in the up, and it's in the agriculture, so it's the whole picture, not uh, forest alone. Uh, and that is, I think, that why we put so much emphasis in the communication on this. And the other reason, of course, is that if you want to generate a thing that is sizable, it's not that tomorrow you have it. It needs to grow. And 2050 is 30 years. What is 30 years for a forest? Hmm. Kind of the trees will still look young uh, for a 30-year-old forest. Um, when they really get to the biggest capacity in order to start absorbing uh, carbon dioxide. So therefore there is also a matter of urgency here uh, that we need to address in the coming years. And it's not because some are saying uh, you're only looking at afforestation because there is this plan to plant 3 billion trees. No, it's also reforestation. Um, when I was traveling uh, by train uh, from here to Berlin, uh, during the summer and you look at the state of the trees and the forests, you get worried. Kind of birch trees are dying everywhere. Uh, spruce trees are dying everywhere. Um, so this is something we need to address. Um, and I think we need to address that urgently. Uh, this is something that is now at our hand. Thank you, Arthur. You actually went into several areas I intended to ask questions about later, but we'll get back to that. Uh, we'll go to, to you, Zhao, in port for, at the Portuguese perm rep instead. Uh, you have considerable forest assets in Portugal, uh, just a very different type from other parts, or for instance, the northern parts of Europe. Um, are you concerned that you could end up being this, the carbon sink for other parts of Europe that decide not to do what they need to do to reduce their fossil emissions? Or do you believe that the uh, solidarity is going to work within the European Union? I believe very truly that, uh, that solidarity is going to work. Uh, this is always an element. Uh, solidarity and fairness is always a, an element that is very present in our discussions in Council. Um, as our taking into account national circumstances, different starting points and uh, uh, the distributional effects, uh, Portugal is very committed to do its part. We have a net zero uh, plan, so um, there, is a, there is a very important role uh, to play also in the forest sector in Portugal. Um, and I would like to pick up on one element. We have not one forest, we have several forests. And uh, it's, it, forests like Council have, uh, I think, are a good example to, to understand why we can't uh, take, there was, there's not going to be a solution fits all and everybody is going to uh, count on a certain member state to, to uh, do its role as a carbon sink. Uh, our forests are productive, we have very specific forests, we have the cork forests that uh, we are very well known to, to explore. So uh, there will be uh, uh, for sure a uh, contribution from our forests uh, as there will be in other points of Europe. Uh, but this is uh, something where fairness and solidarity will play in, and there will be a, a balance in council and uh, in our proposals as uh, there usually is. So this is uh, something we really rely on. Thank you. Um, shortly, Piotr, now if you take on the hat of being a forester, um, wouldn't you be okay being the sink for everyone else as long as you get paid for it? You know, it's, it's uh, not an easy question, of course. Finances is only one, one part of the, of the whole story. But actually, we, we entered into the discussion, uh, which is also like a second part of our interest, because it's for us the role of forests and the sector in, in, in the debate about the future climate objectives and targets. It's not only the mitigation part. Mm -hmm. For us, it's adaptation. I have exactly the same impressions while traveling across Germany that something wrong is going on. But then for us as managers and owners, because we also have to respect the fact that uh, the beginning of the, of, the, of the value chain is with forest owners, with forest managers, millions as, as li making living on this. As Leonard mentioned, also hundred thousands of, of managers and sp other specialists. And we have to ensure that if we want to contribute with the 
mitigation as, uh, as, as a sink function, we have to ensure the proper management. It was already said that it's not even 20 years, it's much more. Mm. But then we need, of course, earn money somewhere to be able to reinvest as forest owners and managers because this is the only guarantee that we maintain the asset in such a condition which will allow providing the best possible contribution to this mitigation part, which that's why this third S substitution for us is so important because it's a source of income. We at the same time, of course, if we have money, we, we know what we do, uh, what to do with this as, as, as owners and managers. But at the same time, let's be honest, we don't believe in such a financial reality that we can make forest uh, management completely dependent on subsidies from uh, somewhere, state budget or in other taxation uh, imposed on the society. I, I mean, is it realistic? these days when we have to recover actually from a huge crisis due I to I think COVID. We, that's probably a, a discussion we could have a whole event around. <laughs> uh, at this point, I'm going to say very welcome to you to Guteland. On this side of the stage, please. And there's a hand microphone which has been cleaned before you came. Thank you for being here. So Jutte is a member of European Parliament. Uh, she's the rapporteur on the climate law. And we're so happy that you could uh, be here. I have already discussed a bit with the gentleman. So you have Piotr Borkowski from the European S State Forest Association. We have João, which is the environmental counselor at the Portuguese PERMRAP. And I'm quite certain that you know Arthur Runge Metzger already. Yes. So I'll recuperate a bit here so that you get a chance to, to talk about some of the things that we've talked about. And then, gentlemen, you can sort of rest for a little while. So um, your report in the European Parliament, uh, what's uh, progressive in many ways, um, but I couldn't see that you were equally progressive on pointing out the importance that we substitute the fossil-based materials for other types of materials, what we often call the material substitution. How come you didn't have that in your report? Um, I, of course, don't want to go in and correct. Uh, that would be rude. <laughs> but we have text on the importance of substitution and the importance of having um, renewable, uh, renewable materials. And I believe that forest is, and, and the whole um, sustainable forest management is a huge potential for climate, as well as for the whole ecosystem with the circular economy. And I really believe that we can have good substitution where we can have uh, a good potential for, for using uh, the wood, uh, not only in, in, for climate, but also in exchange of the, the different commodities that we, we nowadays mm -hmm. don't use in uh, wood. Excellent that I was wrong. I'm yeah. happy to hear that. <laughs> you get happy now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we've also here on stage discussed uh, fairness and solidarity in reaching the 2030 and the 2050 objectives. And there you've gone further than the Commission proposal. You've suggested that every member state should reach these targets, not just the EU as a whole. Do you think you're going to get that through the final negotiations with Council and Commission, the trialogue? I prefer not to speculate too much <laughs> because I also know that uh, there will be a give and take in the negotiations as always. I know you all are uh, involved in, in the politics on the EU level and uh, understand the dynamics of the, the trialogue. But that being said, I'm very happy about the support that we got uh, for this binding element, not only on the EU level, but also on the member state level. Not fr only from some groups, but from a good majority of the groups, and we see uh, both in the Environmental Committee, but now also in front of plenary vote next week, that this is something that, uh, that we got support for in front of plenary. Of course, I don't know how the vote will end, but I'm really happy about it. Mm. Can I very quick say why? Only yes, one of sentence. Course. Uh, because I know, of course, that there is a challenge for some member state to, to go on uh, with the transition uh, because uh, they are, they we are not all in the same level. On the other hand, if member states have a, f a longer distance to reach climate neutrality, if they wait uh, and be, uh, will become too late after the others, the support to get there via EU funds, via uh, just transition funds and other means will be less 
uh, lightly because the member states who already is there will not be happy to see that kind of circulation of means when they already reach climate neutrality. So I believe we need to help more the member states who, who have a longer distance, but they also need to commit to, to reach to climate neutrality. This is the fair game here. Some member states will be unhappy to help, Others will be not happy to raise the ambition, but that's the, that's the Brussels compromise we need to mm. accomplish. Yeah, I see the dilemma there, so... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to sort of go to the final area of questions. And for us in the forest-based sector, it's so self-evident that if you do sustainable forest management, you can increase the sink, increase the storage in forest and products, and get material for smart products. So you can, it's not a question of one or the other, it's a question of all three. And so far, we don't really experience that sustainable forest management is one of those sort of founda building foundations in the EU climate policy. It's more about how big is the sink or da da da. So, Arthur, can we in the future, you think, expect that there will be this? policy development which clearly says that it's the sust active sustainable forest management that will maximize the climate benefit because that also includes harvesting to produce products. Um, I, I would be surprised where you find a sentence where it not talks about um, what we want the agriculture and forestry sector to do, not to do it in an in or unsustainable way. We always say it needs to be sustainable and the different um, streams and the different benefits um, and the different contributions through the different ways you can use forests and use agriculture, they should come to the fore. And I would like to pick up on what uh, Piotr was just saying in terms of at the end of the day, it's the farmer and the forester who will have to make a living. And let's be honest, with the substitution, that works because we have a carbon price in Europe in the energy sector. And that carbon price has been increasing quite a lot, which means it pushes out coal out of the energy mix and it brings in bioenergy, for instance, into the energy mix. And even to some extent that um, we hear complaints, there's too much biomass going into energy use. Um, and the same is true for any other place where we have a carbon price working there is immediately a benefit for forest products, for agricultural products that are produced in a different way. The only area where we don't have that at the present point in time is the sinks. Because today, no state forest can make a living on sinks, because who's going to pay for that? So it means it's not being valued, that function of the forest. And I think that is something where we need to get to at a certain point in time. Because if we don't value the sinks function of the forest and of the agriculture, farms and foresters will not care. And that is what we fear a little bit is happening at the present point in time. I've seen interviews um, where you see plots of forests that are affected by bark beetle. And usually the law says you need to take out that wood from the forest. Um, but of course, that timber is kind of half the value or even much less than the normal timber. And there is some foresters who are refusing to do so. It still has a lot of carbon dioxide in it. So it's not being valued. Mm -hmm. So you'd rather leave it in the forest and it just goes up and becomes CO2 again. So the question really is, and I think that is the central question also in the communication that came just out, how can we make sure that, first of all, um, we count what is happening on the sink side? Because if you don't count, it doesn't count for the farmer. First thing is get the counting right. The second thing is how do you make sure that you put a value to that counting? And that is something we are exploring with the farmers, for instance, in our initiative, which is called carbon farming, which I mentioned before. So to see, is there a way farmers can be rewarded? And that, Piotr, is not a subsidy, it's a reward for a service that you are doing. And I think that is where we need to get to in the end. Uh, that will take us many years. That's not going to happen from today to tomorrow. 
and might not happen between now and 2025 or 2030, but in 2050 we need to be at that place. Otherwise, we might make very wrong decisions, uh, and that's not good. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Jutta, in the Parliament negotiations, there seems to have been quite a lot of focus on forests as sinks. You had this discussion about natural sinks and technological sinks. Tell us a bit, what was all that about? What was the political conflict in it? Yeah, we had it a couple of times now, but uh, there is uh, both uh, regarding the INI for the, the forest strategy, but uh, also, of course, uh, there is the ongoing discussion of how big the, the, the carbon sink um, can be uh, in, in Europe. I think that uh, uh, the Commission underestimates uh, the potential uh, of the, the carbon sink in their own uh, impact assessment. So I think there is a bigger potential. Uh, but for me, it's very important also to point out that a good uh, managed forest uh, will actually improve uh, the carbon sink for Europe, not uh, the opposite. Mm. And for some uh, politicians, they don't have that, uh, I would not be rude and say knowledge, but uh, it's, uh, they have the idea that if, uh, if the forest is reserved, uh, then it will naturally have a bigger uptake from the atmosphere. Uh, but from the point of view and from my home country, Sweden, uh, we have a very common understanding that when the tree is growing, it can have a bigger uptake. So we need to have a managed, uh, a sustainable management of the forest that makes sure that uh, we actually have the production. Um, and then, of course, we plant new trees as well to, to mm -hmm. be able uh, to, to make it bigger. But I think the Commission underestimates the potential. Okay. <laughs> Shortly, yes. Because I want to explain um, why we have been using this value of 225 million tons or so uh, in terms of what the thing could be. That is what member states are reporting to us where they estimate where they think is going to be in the year 2030. We also say in our scenarios the potential could be much bigger, could be 300 million tons. But the question is do these 75 million tons fall like manna from heaven? No, they will not. And you know that very well because there is a forester who will have to manage the forest in an active way. And it means he will have to invest something. He will have to reforest in a certain way. He will have to take care. So there is expenses related to that in order to reverse the thing. So the question is then, and I think Dr. was putting the question, are we going to have to rely on subsidies to happen? Or is there different ways of doing that? And that is the question that the Commission is putting forward in its communication. And that is where we would like to see a debate among foresters, forest industry, uh, farmers, in order to say, look, which direction do we want to go? How do we realize that potential? Because in 2030, you know the calculation of the Commission as well as I do, uh, that is not going to be sufficient for the year 2050. In the year 2050, we reckon we need, probably need a sink um, at the size of 500 million tons. Again, this is not going to fall like manna from heaven or by demanding and saying, you must do this or that. I think that's not going to work in Europe. Ah, a little bit of tension going on yes. here. We like it. Yes. We're turning to you, uh, Zhao. Um, You've heard you to say that, yes, we need to actively manage our forests, thereby we can increase the sink and the storage, etc. We've heard um, Arthur say that, yeah, we want to make sure that the foresters really uh, keep forests in good health and, and sort of make them grow actively. So, once again, Portugal has big forest assets. Are you, from the Portuguese side, are you pushing for this in the council negotiations, that the council would take a clear stand of the importance of active forest management in the climate mitigation policies? Well, like I said, I know we are still in the very beginning of our uh, assessment of this climate uh, assessed plan, so uh, we're looking into several elements. And I, I would like to also point out that um, council under the German presidency is looking 
into other important strategies that the Commission has, uh, has put forward, namely the biodiversity strategy, uh, the circular economy strategy. Next year, as Arthur has said, we will have the forestry strategy and the adaptation strategy. So uh, we have a, a diverse array of, um, of um, elements that we will look into uh, in, in bearing in mind all the ecosystem services that forests provide. So we have to be mindful of uh, the, the broad scope of elements that we will have to look into. Uh, and yes, uh, like I said before, you can count on Portugal's commitment and uh, to develop uh, you know, whatever solutions we can as well. Well, thank you. And with that, I'm going to draw this discussion to a close because we are soon going to continue on another uh, political discussion. So thank you to Artur, Jutte, Piotr, and you, Xiao. And yes, a round of applause, please. <laughs> and you make your way down from the stage as safely as you can. Um, and I'm going to say that it's time for us to move over to discuss the other interesting topic of today, namely sustainable products. So um, this spring, the Commission published a new circular economy action plan. It defines that the Commission, during next year, will present, and I quote, a sustainable product policy legislative initiative. End of quote. That was long. Yeah. We do not know yet exactly what this initiative will contain, but when we note several important items for forest-based products, such as the establishment of sustainability principles, perhaps mandatory recycle content, restriction of single-use products, and the reduction of overpackaging and packaging waste. It is obvious for us when reading the action plan that the Commission is focusing on several vital concepts. They call them reuse, upgrade, repair, and recycle. So let's compare these concepts for two products that we can all associate to. And the first one is a bike. It can and should be reused for years. It can definitely be upgraded. You need to repair it regularly. And once you know it's too old for you, at least you can recycle parts of it. So the bike tick all four of these concepts. If we then look at a medicine packaging, you should not reuse it. That could actually be dangerous for your health. Why should you upgrade it? You can repair it if it's broken with a piece of tape, but you should definitely recycle it. So the packaging only ticks one of the four. Does that, my definition, mean that the packaging is less sustainable than the bike? No, that is a way too narrow perspective, we would say. And talking about recycling, it's worth remembering that you heard before from Juri Ringman that 72% of paper and board consumed in Europe is recycled today. It is a high number. This number has been developed over decades and the recycling operations are well integrated into the forest-based industries. And within these recycling operations, you have fresh and recycled fibers and they play different roles. Uh, depending on, for instance, customer specifications, or geography or availability of recycled material. So in other words, it's not a question of one or the other, it's a question of both have their roles to play. And with that being said, it is time for the next panel to enter the stage or the screens. Oh, excuse me, I made a mistake. We're gonna ask you a menti question and you have already been on the case. Good for me to uh, get that right. And this time we have asked you to tell us what you think characterize a sustainable product to you. We have eight alternatives and let's see what we have. We have a clear preference that the product should be from a renewable resource. It should be recyclable. It should help keep fossils in the ground and it should protect biodiversity. Those are the top four characteristics that you choose to put on a sustainable product. Things are developing in front of our eyes here. But the four that I mentioned are still very much in the lead, you could say. I think it, to a large extent, uh, reflects the audience that we have today, where we have a lot of forest owners and forest industry representatives. Good. Then we are going to move on to uh, uh, introduce the next panel. 
So I welcome up on stage Mr. Clive Pinnington, who is the Managing Director at the European Panel Federation. Welcome. Thank you. And you and I, we are going to have the whole stage to ourselves because uh, digitally we are connected to two more participants. We have Christian Egenhofer, who is a senior research fellow and head of energy and climate at CEPS, a well-known think tank here in Brussels. Welcome, Christian. Hello. Um, and we have Emmanuel Maire, head of unit for sustainable production, products and consumption at the Directorate General uh, for Environment at the European Commission. Welcome. Good morning to everyone. And the technology is working. Uh, it makes life a lot easier up here. So, uh, you just saw what the audience stated uh, as characteristics for a sustainable product. I'll ask the same question to you to begin with, and I'll start with the lady. So, Mayor, if you in a few, <laughs> few statements could say what is a sustainable product to you, what would you say, Emmanuel? Well, I think this is an excellent question, one that has been keeping us very busy at the European Commission, and uh, surely will uh, continue to, to do so. Uh, we know that there are many, many products on the European Union markets uh, which are not sustainable. Why? Because they use a lot of resources uh, during production, for example, the impact of mining. They cause pollution and resource use during their use phase, uh, for example, energy, water, emissions. They have a short uh, product lifetime, for example, single use or uh, early uh, obsolete uh, products not repairable. And uh, they are uh, very uh, poor in terms of remanufacturing uh, performance. And the end result is that they end up in uh, being incinerated or uh, landfills. So what we have been doing is to develop methods at European Union level to uh, measure uh, the life cycle impacts of, uh, of products. And those methods are called the environmental footprint uh, methods. And they are known, I guess, to many participants. Mm -hmm. So you have mentioned the circular economy action plan and the highlights, the key action on the circular economy action plan is the sustainable product initiative, uh, which aim at developing sustainable uh, principles so that products uh, last uh, longer, have reduced environmental uh, footprint, and really uh, deliver for what consumers, uh, be, it, be they uh, final consumers like, like you and I, or public uh, buyers uh, deliver. So I would encourage you to give uh, your vision of what sustainable products are in the uh, public consultation, which is ongoing on uh, sustainable product uh, policy. Well, thank you. Uh, I'll turn to you, Clive, now. What thank would the characteristics for a sustainable product be for you? Thank you, Anna. Well, the, the mentee rather stole my thunder. I was going to, of course, highlight the renewable aspect of, of products. We, we fully support what, uh, what Mrs. Mayer has said about uh, products lasting longer, reusable, recyclable, incorporating recycled material. But certainly from the forest-based industries, we have the joy of having a renewable material. We think somehow that should feature uh, in this um, initiative, possibly through the product environmental footprint or LCAs, as, as has just been said. Uh, when I was thinking about it, I thought, well, if we say we are automatically sustainable because we're renewable, does that make us complacent? No, it doesn't. Take what I know well, particle board, like you have in your kitchens, in your, in your furniture around the house. There are particle boards that are made 90% from recovered wood and industrial byproducts. 90%, more than 90%. So just because we're renewable doesn't mean that we won't espouse these values of, of durability and uh, uh, long life. So I'm, I'm very happy about that. And, and what we're thinking about is this concept of natural, sustainable carbon capture and storage in trees and wood-based products. And that's what we would like to take to this discussion. Okay, thank you. 
And over to you, Christian. You work at a think tank, so you can allow yourself to have this sort of outside perspective on things. Um, do you have a view on what a sustainable product is? We're working on, on, on this. And you have seen in, in this poll and also in your initial example, uh, it depends very much on the product. And of course, different products will have different combinations. So what I have not yet heard is that how do we account for technological evolution? Products will be changing uh, very, very fast. Arthur has mentioned the innovation part, very imp important. And there will be a moment where a new product, even if it's recycled or reused many times, may be beneficial in the life cycle than others. So we need some sort of dynamic uh, adjustment uh, to take uh, that into account. Uh, now, for this, the key point, uh, Emmanuel mentioned it already, is, of course, uh, the carbon footprint information. And luckily, there is a lot of information available from the JRC, uh, for example. And the origin, you know, I would be personally very interesting to see what's the outcome of the German supply law in the end, once it's adopted and in what form, I think we will get a lot of information, whichever way this goes. Interesting, because just like listening to the three of you, there are so many aspects that you can connect to sustainable products. There are so many ways to approach this concept. There's so many ways to define it. So we will now sort of focus and drill a bit on some of these items. I don't claim that we will have time enough to to drill on all of them, but the first one I'm going to lift is, would a mandatory recycle content improve product sustainability? And I'll start with a claim. I would say that uh, we in the forest-based sector, we claim that requesting such a mandatory content for a product to be seen as sustainable, it might sound nice, it might show good policy intentions, but the outcome could actually be that for some value change, it could destroy already well-functioning systems. So what might initially sound like, you know, smart policy could have some other sides to it. So Clive, for your, the business that you represent, would a mandatory recycle content be a positive thing? Would it create value added, growth? Would it sort of take you forward? Well, uh, a bit like you, Anna, uh, Theoretically, yes, but in practice, we're very hesitant over this, and, and I'll explain why. C conceptually, we prefer market-driven change to regulatory change. We'd rather it's the consumers who, who wish to purchase a product with recycled content, so we'd rather educate them than, than oblige them by, by forcing it into the chain. Uh, the reason we feel this is, I, I told you just now, in particle board, we have 90% recycled. So on the one hand, we should say, great, the more the better, we can do it. There are other products, though, where it's much, much harder, in fact, technically not possible at this stage. Uh, many of you are on uh, remote access, but those of you who are here in the room, you're sitting on plywood chairs. Plywood cannot be made with recycled material. It, it, we're not there. We don't have that. So if you were to oblige that from tomorrow, plywood would disappear. It would be replaced by other products which might be far less beneficial to the climate, for example. So we are, we are very uh, cautious about mandatory uh, recycled content. We would, we would much rather create secondary raw material streams, consider outlets for them, of which we would be one for sure, but then let the consumer pull those through rather than pushing them from the regulatory side. Okay, interesting. Christian, uh, once again, your think tank perspective. Would it be good policy development to push for mandatory recycle content? What do you think? I mean, mandatory recycling content can be very, very powerful uh, if you can make it work. Some of the concerns have been mentioned. But we've also seen that once the policymakers need to decide about the content, there is this issue of uh, information asymmetry. You know, the industry and, and their groups, they know, have all the data, and then there becomes a kind of a negotiation uh, with the, the policymakers. Now, maybe it's better, I mean, I would prefer from what we have seen, something like a modular fee tax, like they have introduced in, in France, uh, 
that you 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 have a, you pay a fee according to the level of recycling uh, you're doing. So you have a you can play the recycling content if you think it makes sense uh, against the tax. If you if it becomes too expensive, you 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 pay a tax. So this gives incentives to do the more uh, economic things. On top, you could actually then put also. A green public procurement really to give a product uh, a, a, a push. Uh, now, let me just add one last point, Anna, if I may. I mean, we are talking here about also talk wood, forestry and wood-based policy, and we had this discussion with Arthur and others uh, beforehand, what kind of support you need for substitution. And I think for your products, actually, the question of a specific uh, support measures is not that evident. You know, if there is a pricing element in carbon, uh, direct or explicit or implicit, you know, you will find the your products will find the the way in into the market. So I think we should uh, keep uh, keep this in mind. This is very different for steel and cement, where we still need a lot of uh, breakthrough technology innovation. Well, thank you. So, Emmanuel. Can we, in our value chain, can we expect that you will put forward a, a proposal for mandatory recycled content of, uh, for instance, paper and board products? Thank you very much. I think that I would like to take the question a bit more generally, so not uh, wood uh, and paper specific, but really at large, because it has been uh, a strong uh, policy from the European Commission to push uh, for mandatory recycled content. Uh, why? Because uh, we are recycling a, a lot in the European Union, uh, but still the secondary uh, raw materials market are not always uh, competitive uh, enough compared to buying uh, virgin uh, material. And this is why, for example, with plastics, we've been pushing for recycled uh, content for example, in plastic bottles that will now need to incorporate uh, recycled uh, plastics, but also pushing the industry to come up with uh, commitments both to deliver uh, 10 million tons of uh, recycled plastics and uptaking also these quantities in, in new products. So in, in general policy line, yes, mandatory recycled content is extremely uh, important uh, to uh, avoid always relying on virgin uh, material and, and leading to uh, the impacts we know, be it on, on climate change or uh, biodiversity, for example. We do, however, acknowledge that there are technical uh, limitations, uh, for example, in terms of uh, uh, trade-offs with the uh, robust nest as uh, highlighted uh, previously, on safety issues. Uh, so in any event, those trade-offs would need to be considered. And the life cycle uh, analysis of products is uh, and remain uh, capital. So it sounds to me as if there's probably not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. It's going to be have to be a bit more tailor-made from the Commission side, perhaps. Hmm? Uh, let's move on to um, uh, another interesting topic. Um, once again, um, where we claim that when reading the new circular economy action plan, uh, there is a strong focus on what I would call the ecological pillar of sustainability. But we claim that the products that we produce, they um, contribute immensely to European economy resilience, a very important topic nowadays due to the corona pandemic. Because we are, as Juri Ringman said before, sourced in Europe, made in Europe with European technology, mainly for European consumers, and to a high degree recycled in Europe. And uh, we feel that the economic pillars must also be reflected in the sustainable product policy that we are expected next year. So I'll start with you this time, Christian. Um, from your perspective, should the policy initiative make sure that we also build a resilient EU economy by perhaps pushing for products like our own? So where do you stand on that? Would that be fair or would that be poor policy development? 
Yeah, you, you're not asking for uh, trade barrier or autarchism and this kind of stuff, although you were sort of scratching a little bit on this, but I know you, Anna, you wouldn't uh, do that. Um, now, I think that the key is really, you know, how to you create product differentiation. Be it low carbon, you can put low carbon circularity, you can put European content, you can, in principle, you know, put everything uh, into there. So how do we differentiate? Uh, of course, the first element is we are living in a market economy, is price, relative prices, uh, ETS, taxation, Arthur has mentioned that. Obviously, this has limits. We all know this. That's why we move down to the regulatory side. Uh, but uh, product differentiation, there are other, other possibilities for product differentiations. And we have a lot of examples in, in energy, for example, the area I'm working on. We have uh, green labels, uh, guarantees of origin. In power, it wasn't all that perfect, but it's a good tool. In gas, we will have guarantees of origin. Uh, you, and this has a, two effects. One, you can have an effect on the direct, on the consumer, the end consumer. Some may want to buy more green than others, but the real impact on energy has been through the corporate customers, through the, the famous uh, power purchasing agreement, where all those who use a lot of electricity have said, we want to reduce our uh, carbon uh, footprint um, in, in, in our operation. So that product differentiation uh, is really the key. And the more you can push it to give an incentive to corporate, I think it would be beneficial. Whatever you put the label under, uh, a European uh, product. But my question to you was actually, should the sustainability criteria also include the economic pillar? And you gave me answers that were once again more environmentally oriented. I mean, oh, look, the, the Green Deal. Uh, I mean, I, yeah, I hear this question very often. Huh? But the Green Deal has outlined uh, very much uh, both uh, sides very much the environmental part and the economic uh, growth area. So I may be a little bit uh, naive. I assume this is already incorporated in there. Obviously, uh, we want to have uh, European uh, products, but they need to be competitive. Uh, and if they are competitive, they should be given a chance on the market. And here you talk green steel, green cement, if it then exists. I'm just uh, afraid where we have a a mobile phone uh, made in Europe, uh, which is designed by uh, some very rigid uh, regulation, and then uh, this becomes then 30% more expensive because it's produced in, in, in Europe, and we believe we are more resilient uh, to this. But this is this balance you will have uh, to you will have to uh, to find, and um, that will different people will see that very differently, and will continue to have a debate on this. But of course, the economics are uh, the, the, the pillar under which this uh, Green Deal uh, sails. Well, thank you. Uh, Emmanuel, two questions. First of all, when you publish the initiative next year, uh, will it include sustainability criteria covering all three pillars? And will you give some sort of preference to products that actually help rebuilding Europe after the corona pandemic? Yes, maybe just to, to recall the, um, the mandate uh, that we got at uh, political level that the uh, European Green Deal and all the initiatives uh, which are related uh, to it, including the Saint-Alain Economy Action Plan, are really uh, pushing towards uh, green growth and giving opportunities uh, to companies that invest in sustainable uh, products in new uh, business models that have uh, less uh, impact on the environment. So we see that betting on green is um, a growth uh, strategy. And this is actually reflected in legislative uh, proposals that could take place as of next year, be it on sustainable product policy or on green claims, but this is also reflected in uh, the financial support uh, which will be uh, given. You know that the recovery and resilience facility will have more than 672 uh, billion uh, investments possibilities for member states. 
uh, subject to what they consider as uh, their priorities at national level. And we have issued guidance uh, on the 19th of September to member states, clearly stressing that you know, sustainable products, sustainable business uh, models, uh, repair uh, activities should be uh, supported by, by member states. So it's actually a larger uh, policy and political um, uh, evolution that is taking place. I see. Okay, interesting. So, Clive, um, Emmanuel talks about the green growth, the growth agenda. Um, shouldn't the forest-based products fit like a hand in a glove in that scenario, or what do you think? Uh, exact, exactly as you said it, Anna, and you, you said it also earlier, this horrible pandemic has taught us the fragility of transport, the fragility of travel. Local is surely the way to go. And this, uh, you know, I say this as a professional, but also as a consumer. You walk in the street, people are, people are aware of this. They want, they want to be reliant, more reliant on their own continent, not having to import everything. Uh, I stand here today representing wood-based panels, uh, my federation, but also the broader forest-based industries. We have to be proud of what we are. We are, you said it earlier, made in Europe, sold in Europe, sourced in Europe. By definition, we are adding to that resilience. So let's be proud. Let's say that. Let's get that message out. Uh, I have great faith in the, in the Commission and in the Parliament to make sure that that feeds into the legislation in whatever way, perhaps through green public procurement, perhaps that we give it a, an initial spurt by recognizing the local quality of these products. And then, as ever, leave it to the consumer. They, they will buy local if they can. So I have, I have full confidence that can happen. Thank you. Then we're also going to talk a bit about how to empower consumers. Because in the action plan, the commission is clear that uh, there are uh, strong intentions to empower consumers to make the sustainable, the right choices. And, and we claim from our side that our products, as you heard, Jure Ringman say, our products create a benefit already today. It can be on climate change mitigation, it can be on EU economic resilience, etc. It's not something that will come 10, 20 or 30 years down the road. It's here today to be collected and picked up uh, if applicable. So I would like to stick my neck out here and say that I think the sustainable product policy should actually make these products preferential that, that create a benefit today. So Christian, shortly on this one, uh, would that be good policy design from your perspective? Or should it be more neutral? What do you say as a think tank? Um, Anna, uh, very shortly, but let me just say one thing about the indicators, the previous question I really need to do. You know, every interest group wants an in indicator. And then in the end, we have lots of indicators and our policy seems to be done by an algorithm. You know, in the end, this is a political balance, what kind of indicators we, we use in the end. So that's, I just wanted to say. Now, uh, you know, I, I would like to, to, to return uh, to the point we need to think about whether we want to really push sort of the direct customer uh, empowerment uh, where we are giving customers an incentive to do or we want to do it indirectly uh, through industries and, and brands. There are good examples for both. I mentioned energy, organic food as well, and uh, sustainable agriculture. What really uh, impressed me recently by now, companies are not all, in the beginning, they all address the scope one emissions. Now, no company in the consumer product is able to address uh, scope two emissions, uh, to not to address scope two emissions. And some now even go to scope uh, three emissions. Let me just say scope one is direct emissions, the other un indirect from the energy you're buying. And the scope three is all the other indirect emissions. So if you, you, create a, you can create a framework that really the, the, con, the, pro, the companies trying to incorporate that because that increases their, grant, their brand, that makes it more valuable, and the customers ask for this. I think that is really the way you, where you can uh, empower consumers. Of course, as an individual, you also should be given the right through labeling and other tools uh, to do this. But at scale, you, you get it, in my view, only through more indirect uh, ways. Okay, so Emmanuel, are we being naive when we expect that the policy proposal could be preferential 
for products that create a benefit now, today. Uh, would that be naive to ask for that from you uh, in your policy development? Well, I think that at the European Commission, we are always technologically, uh, technologically neutral. So that's a very important principle to, uh, to re recall. And when uh, we claim that the product is uh, sustainable, uh, we need to know what it is that we mean. And actually, this is what consumers want to know these days, uh, because there is a great opportunity uh, to uh, explain uh, how green our products are. And this is precisely uh, the reason why we would like uh, to launch, in addition to uh, possible market requirements under the Sustainable Product uh, Policy Initiative, uh, to launch another initiative on green claims. And I really would like to invite everyone to participate in the public consultation, which is ongoing. Because what we see is that we have apparently 500 methodologies at international levels that calculate in some way or another the carbon, carbon footprint, the land use impact, the ecotoxicity on water, on human health, and so on. And at the end of the day, we are comparing apple and pie, and it's impossible for consumers to find their ways and not only final consumers, but also uh, in the B2B uh, relation. So this is why we are proposing different options uh, to uh, regulate uh, green claims, to push uh, towards market developments for green products, but on the basis of a clear methodology, which is in our view, the environmental footprint uh, methodologies which have been developed and tested at European Union level. And they do not take into account one single indicator to the detriment of other uh, environmental impacts. They look at the entirety of the life cycle uh, of uh, products or organizations. So strong plead mm -hmm. to look at the, the Green Claims initiatives as well. Well, thank you. Clive, I'm going to let you get the last word here. That's the privilege. So, so the discussion here has been about what space can there be for yeah. forest-based products in the future EU sustainable products policy. So if you sort of get your, get your magnifying glass out, and, and you know, what do you see ahead of you here? What's the space going to be? Th thank you, Anna. <laughs> well, to answer that, I, I'm going to take you back to 2012. The London Olympics. I'm British, you can hear it in my voice. I met the uh, specifier for the stadium, Sustainable Olympics. Stadium, not a trace of wood in it. And I was furious and I said, what the heck? You know, this is the Sustainable Olympics, where's the wood? And he said, Clive, you have the best story. Maybe you're not the best at telling it. And it was so painful, that comment. I hated it. But I decided, resilience, I'll, you know, we will get better. Fast forward. 2020, Brussels, you heard it quoted earlier today. Commission President von der Leyen, let's build with wood. I, I'm not going to re-quote it, it's, it's been said. So I do think the message is much stronger than it was in 2012. I hope he's listening today. And I firmly believe that using wood is certainly the way forward. Uh, so what's the space for us? I think it's never better. We, we, we're a half a trillion in euro, 3.5 million direct jobs, mainly in rural areas. We're naturally sustainable, and I think we need to work with the EU institutions to get this message out. I think if we do, the consumers will listen, and their actions will lead to a good future for the forest-based industries and for Europe itself. Thank you. Well, thank you. And yes, a round of applause for the people on link and on. So thank you, Christian. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you, Clive. And now I'm going to turn over to Claire Cue of CEPI, who's going to tell us a bit what's been buzzing on Twitter while we've been talking. Anything interesting going on? Thank you, Anna. Good morning, everyone. Um, so clearly the main topic of the conversation online today was forests. Uh, a lot of comments on the role of forests as sinks, um, but they should be used for more than the sinks. Uh, so that clearly uh, attracted a lot of attention. And then, of course, some questions about how can we reconcile the different expectations about forests, so really about the first panel uh, this morning. 
And then um, another point of discussion was uh, the role of the forest based industries. And uh, people commenting on a quote from uh, MEP Petri Sarvama uh, about the combination of forest based industries and sustainable forest management being really the solution for the future, uh, offering answers to the challenges. Um, so these were also a lot of comments. And then um, on the sustainable product, what is a sustainable product? So that really opened up to, well, many- The million dollar question. <laughs> exactly, many, many answers and, and many uh, points. Um, so that was really interesting to follow. Maybe I'll finish with two points. One, uh, on the Menti platform, you can leave some comments about the event today. So yeah. go ahead. And uh, the second point is that the live stream is recorded. So everybody that missed uh, maybe the first part, the second part can watch it afterwards. Well, That's thank it. you. Thank you. And now, Juri, it's time for you to join me on stage again. You can choose whichever island you want. <laughs> well, this one is near. Yeah, that's yours, isn't it? So, um, in this second seminar, we've discussed two very relevant topics, climate change mitigation and sustainable products. And I'll start with the climate discussion. Uh, was there a, you know, a main takeaway from your side from that discussion? I would love to say that we, we passed the message. I, I, I like the, the comment by Clive that we have to become better in, in passing the messages and, and communicating. And I would love to stand here and say that now, yes. now it went through. Everybody understood the, the, the role of product in the climate policy, in the three S. Mm. So I think it's easy to understand the storage, the sink, but when we start talking about substitution, I think people are not yet really getting it. That's, that's my feeling. And, and then I was in particular listening to the commission and I, I was missing mm -hmm. him saying that, yes, products have a role in this. And then it's like uh, people start now talking about the climate smart forestry. I think we are missing in the climate policy, the, the climate smart product policy mm -hmm. that would be then, mm -hmm. then looking into that from the climate perspective. So that's, that's I, I think that mm. the main so takeaway is that it's, we still have to work We're more. not yet through we the wall. We are not there yet, oh, no, yeah. no. And did you pick up on any, any clear threats from the climate mitigation discussion? Well, I, I think that's the, the threat as well, that unless we succeed to, to have this balance between the, the three S, so have the role of all the three S, then people First of all, they don't understand what the difference between sink and, and storage. Mm. <laughs> so that's already difficult for people. And, and then obviously they will not, not see the substitutions impact. And therefore, like I tried to say in the introduction that we might actually even get the opposite effect that, uh, that yeah. then, then we, we actually have substitution go the other way, the more fossil intensive production. And if we then turn to the discussion on sustainable products, a main takeaway there? Well. That's somehow the funny thing, I think, that these, these things are so linked that there, on the other hand, I would uh, call for, for more the understanding of the resilient product policy. And I, I think that was coming from some of the panelists and that was really, really nice and helpful. And, and I would like to, to see that. You remember I said that this ecosystem is giving jobs to 3.5 million Europeans. And then this way of, of having the resilient green growth uh, moving product policy would be, would be necessary. And I, I think that was more maybe coming, coming through and, and, and understanding that, and maybe it's more obvious for people. So that was, that was positive. And then again, of course, we can't emphasize too much how much we have to also there communicate what our sector can do there. Because like we said, that there's no one size that fits all. And, and you have to look at the, the product life cycle of all the product, different uh, products and, and, and materials. And, and, see where we can really improve ourselves, but also where we can say that we already are performing very well compared to the competitors. And, and this question might sound almost a bit sort of a intellectual, hypothetical, but is it even possible to define a sustainable product? Well, I, I think it's the, the philosophical question about sustainability in general, that uh, it's, it's a way forward, but you never know when you have met the, the finishing line. So. I think it's, it's just committing to the continuous improvements. And, and I think in this sector, in this ecosystem, that's actually a natural way of doing that. Like it was mentioned that even sustainable forest management still has to improve. And I, I don't think that there's any question about that by the forest managers and owners. They, they know it very well. And, and they, they have understood many things before 
the, the people in the street, but, but it doesn't mean that they, they are now fully met the, the, the level that this is the, the best possible. So in the sustainable policy, uh, product policy discussion, did you hear any clear threats in what was being said or, or sort of uh, uh, issues in what was being said here today? I don't know if it's a threat, but I think we all have to be aware of the fact that in the end it's, it's a choice. Like, I can't remember who of the panelists said that, but, uh, but the policy is not made with an algorithm, so it's actually, it's still a political choice. And then that will be made by people and, and, and often people who have very little link to our ecosystem, to our sectors, to forestry. They have a lot of ideas. Forest in particular is so emotional thing and that's a great thing. It, it, it is a lot of positive emotions there, but, uh, but if you don't have in addition to that also all the necessary information, then the choice might not be the optimal choice and then it might all get horribly wrong. Not only for us, but for the society. Precisely, yeah. Um, we have today uh, talking about, we've spoken about more or less the whole, uh, the full length of the value chain, the forest-based value chain. We've talked about forest strategy, we talked about climate mitigation, which we know happens along the whole value chain, and we're talking about, uh, about products. Um, would you say, is that a way forward to get through to the policy makers, or should we chop things up in small digestible pieces? Well, of course, we all love to talk about our own sector that is only one part of the value chain, and, and typically maybe one or two parts of the, the whole life cycle as well, so not covering typically not the whole full life cycle. Although in, in our ecosystem, that's also, I think the strong point is that we have fully integrated, for example, recycling to the, the, the primary production of the material. So that makes things much more optimal and much more functioning together. But we love to talk about our own sector and, and, and that's, that's of course not always the best thing to do. But still, we heard so many times people also referring to the, the public opinion. So what do the citizens thinks, think? And, and then I think we, we really have to link it not only to the whole value chain to explain how the value chain is, is offering what it offers for people for their daily needs, mm -hmm. what they need for their good life, and then what is our offering that then. And I don't think we have a bad story in that. So that's the positive thing. Mm -hmm. Then a final question here. Um, we have claimed here today that our value chain is in the lead in many ways on climate change mitigation, creating a resilient EU economy. We claim that our products are, I think you said, climate naturally sustainable or something like that. So we claim that we are in the lead. So should EU policy focus on making it possible for those in the lead to go even further or to get, make the ones who are behind catching up? <laughs> because one policy is probably not yeah. going to achieve all of that. I think uh, classically the, the policies are looking only for the, the ones who are lacking behind. And it's, it's probably the, the similar kind of situation that you would recognize from schools, that if you have a class full of students, they, they, some are the troublemakers and some are the, the silent good students. And, and then the difficulty for the teacher is to think of what to focus on, to focus on the, the, the troublemakers, but then maybe miss the opportunity of, of cultivating the, the next Nobel Prize winner in the class, the, the silent one, that didn't get the support and, and the, the, the encouragement for her studies. So that's why I think that the, the same risk is also in the policy, that if you don't have actually both there, and then Policymakers should have more resources than one single poor teacher, of course. So <laughs> that's why I think it's fair to ask it to the policymakers that focus on both. Keep pressure on the, 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 those who lag behind. I think that's a question for fairness. It's mm -hmm. a question of level playing field. We are often competing with those guys as well. But also help creating opportunities so that we, are, can, we can really, maybe we don't win the Nobel Prize, who knows, but, but at least we, we are quite confident that we have a lot to offer for, for this society. So give us the opportunity for that. So we need both. Well, I think that was excellent ending words from your side. So uh, we're here, we're in the front. Give us the opportunity to continue to push. 
Thank you. And thereby, on behalf of the organizers, I want to extend a big thank you to all speakers and panelists, to you who have been here in the room with us physically, and of course, to all of you watching the live broadcasting. Thank you for spending so many hours together with us. We know you're busy people, but you chose and you evaluated to be with us, and for that we say a big, big thank you. But we have to remember one thing, that this is not the end of the climate or sustainable policy debate. No, this is more or less only the beginning, perhaps. So I'm not going to say goodbye to you. I'm going to say bis später, a bientôt, and see you later instead, because this discussion is going to continue. And when we continue that, make sure you remember that the sustainable future needs the three S's, the sequestration, the storage, and the substitution. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for today. And for those of you in the room, there is a light lunch served in the bar, which is by the lobby.